All right, welcome. Uh, we're going to allow a couple minutes for everybody to be let in here. All right, it looks like we've got quite a few people that are joining us and have been with us for sessions uh, earlier today. So for those of you that are just joining for this last session um, of the Virtual Adaptive Ag Water Symposium, um, we are, uh, this is our final session for the day and uh, these sessions will, uh, are, are being recorded and they will be archived on our website. Um, so, I just wanted to highlight our agenda here. So we are gonna have Matt Delaney here uh, for our third speaker here on drought, wildfire risk and climate change. And then at the end of his talk, we have a little time for a wrap up discussion. And since uh, our group um, is thinned out a little bit at the end of the day, um, we'll have invite your input in the chat box, but we'll also allow for opportunity after um, after Matt's presentation to provide some input input and reflections on the day. Um, for those of you that attended all three sessions or the last two sessions or even just Matt's session, um, we would love to invite your reflections in the chat box towards the end of his presentation and also get input uh, for, this is the first Adaptive Ag Water Symposium uh, that had aspirations of being a full day multi-track conference for the Western region. And of course, we're a small virtual event, but we hope that this will be an event we can collect partners and collaborators and maybe uh, have this be a biennial or every two year event. Um, if there's interest and we'd love your input on speakers, uh, topics and so forth. Um, this input will also be gathered in our evaluation, but I just wanted to throw that out there. So if you, maybe you're enticed to stick around for that. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, Matt, so you can get yours okay. loaded <clears throat> and I'll go ahead and introduce you. So, um, Matt Delaney is uh, the treasurer for the Dry Farming Institute and the coordinator for this uh, event. Um, so Matt is also a forest ecologist and owner of Delaney Forestry Services, LLC, based in Lebanon, Oregon. He holds a, a master's degree in forestry from the University of Illinois and a bachelor's uh, in environmental studies uh, from SUNY College in, uh, of environmental si science and forestry. So over the course of his 20 year career, he's worked on a variety of forestry and natural resource projects throughout the US and internationally. Uh, his recent work with the US Forest Service and the USDA NRCS, Natural Resource Conservation Service, is focused on developing innovative solutions to multiple natural resources challenges in the Western US. Um, so utilizing biomass, wildfire risk reduction, drought mitigation, for example, and for his talk today, uh, Matt's gonna be discussing his work with biochar, so made from forestry debris as an agricultural amendment to help boost crop yields and decrease water use. He's also gonna cover a recent project he helped implement in Eastern Oregon, uh, working with the uh, Gilliam, Co uh, Gilliam County Soil and Water Conservation District to increase community wildfire uh, resiliency through improved map making and then finally, Matt's going to also talk a little bit about green fire breaks uh, using forage kosha and how they could help uh, protect crops from wildfire damage. So um, with that, Matt, if you, you want to go ahead and share your screen. OK. Thanks, Amy. All right. Hi, everybody, and thanks. Um, how does that work? And uh, you're going to want to put your in full screen mode. There we go. Oh, okay. there we go. OK, great. <laughs> OK, great. Thanks, Amy. Uh, so yeah, um, hi, everybody, and welcome. Um, and thanks for being here today. Uh, my talk is titled Drought, Wildfire Risk, and Climate Change, Challenges and Opportunities for Farmers. And as Amy said, uh, I'm going to be covering just uh, about five different topics. And just as a uh, just go through those here real quick how drought issues can impact forests and agriculture, helping community, communities become more fire resilient, an example from a project that I was a part of in Gilliam, 
County, Oregon. Then we're going to talk a little bit about green fire breaks along field ed edges to protect crops from wildfire damage. And then uh, some of my work on biochar amendments to help increase soil moisture and water infiltration. And then I'm going to close up with just a brief uh, mention of carbon offsets as a potential new source of revenue for farmers. Okay, so uh, fires in the Western United States were historic, uh, including in the Pacific Northwest. And as actually Amy uh, talked about in her last um, talk, uh, typically Oregon is pretty dry in the summer and uh, water levels are, are low in, in creeks and rivers and things like that. Um, and, but this past summer was, was, was particularly uh, dry. Uh, there were there were drought emergencies. Uh, the National Weather Service was very concerned about the conditions in our state and other parts of the Western U.S. And in early September, a sort of a strange weather pattern was predicted to form, which involved um, oops, sorry about that, which involved um, a kind of the buildup of a high pressure system that was predicted to cause a lot of high winds. And so all of these conditions, all of these um, Low, uh, low, high humidity conditions uh, and this this strange uh, high pressure system that started forming, combined together to cause quite a uh, windstorm uh, that actually blew out of the eastern part of the the, the region and blew west, kind of like Santa Ana winds in California. We're not used to those here in the Pacific Northwest. And what this this windstorm event really did was it fanned the flames of existing fires that were already burning. So it really added kind of uh, kind of blew those up and uh, also knocked over power lines, uh, which sparked new fires. And um, I thought this article by um, Catherine Caruso from the Forest Service was uh, really, really well done, including the picture that I that I have here that that uh, was part of the article that looks like something out of a, an apocalyptic movie to me. Um, but basically, the, the, the title of the article was was really, I thought was really something else. It was when the extraordinary becomes the ordinary. And she goes on to describe how, how so many ordinary people in our region did extraordinary things during a dangerous series of wildfires across our, our area. Uh, one of the quotes that really was also striking in her article was uh, by John Giller, who was the uh, inter regional interagency director for fire and aviation for the Bureau of Land Management in Oregon and Washington. And he said, there was no fire prediction system that we have which could have predicted what we actually experienced on the ground this year, which I thought was a pretty uh, powerful statement coming from an experienced uh, firefighter. So uh, over the course of about 30 days in September or late August to uh, and through September, there was a fire severely damaged communities across Oregon and, and also in Washington and California, but here in Oregon, um, and, and particularly on the west side of Oregon, uh, the, the devastation was really, really something else. Um, the cities like towns and cities of uh, Mill City and Gates and Ashland um, were just um, severely damaged. In total, during this fire season, about 1.2 million acres of land um, has burned in Oregon. Nine people were killed, 4,000 homes were destroyed and 40,000 people had to be evacuated. So certainly uh, the, the wildfires were certainly historic in our state this year. So one of the, one of the key questions is, well, why is this happening? And uh, one of the, um, there's a couple of different reasons. There's, 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 there's more than a couple probably. <laughs> Forest management issues are certainly one of them. But uh, climate change is certainly uh, a contributing factor as well. According to NOAA, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere today is higher than it's been over the last 400,000 years at least. And as you can see here on the green arrow on the right, our current concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere is over 400 parts per million. And the annual rate of increase uh, in carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere just in the last 60 years is a hundred times faster than it's been during previous natural increases. So not only are we uh, high, higher than we've ever been in 
a long, long time. We've gone up faster than um, than we have historically. So it's and there's a clear historical record correlating um, atmospheric levels of CO2 and temperature. This NOAA graph illustrates that I think pretty well, showing a correlation between fluctuations of CO2 in the atmosphere and temperature. As CO2 levels rise and fall, so, uh, so does temperature. So what does this mean for the Pacific Northwest? One thing it means um, for our region and other Western states is drought. As detailed in the Oregon uh, Climate Change Center report from 2019, Oregon has warmed two degrees Fahrenheit since 1900 and is expected to increase four degrees more by the year 2100. Higher temperatures are expected to extend the growing season, uh, high, longer summers, so, so in, in other words, but all, all Oregon State says that uh, producers may be limited by water and have limited adaptive uh, capacity. The USDA Northwest Climate Hub also predicts changes in temperature and growing seasons. And they encourage farmers in Western Oregon to increase irrigation efficiency in anticipation of shutoffs. The, the Northwest Climate Hub also says dry farming is one technique that farmers can use to respond to reduced irrigation and early shutoffs. So what does this mean for farmers? Uh, farmers in our region are already feeling the effects of drought and early irrigation shutoffs. I thought Amy did a great job in her earlier presentation talking about uh, Oregon water law and um, irrigation rights and things like that. Um, but here are a couple of great quotes from some of our local farmers here in Oregon and how irrigation shutoffs have affected them. And they talk about things like these kinds of early shutoffs because of water scarcity never having uh, occurred on their uh, farms in the, uh, before. And um, I think it's very important that we support principles and practices that make farmers more resilient to water limitations, which is why I'm so excited about being a part of the Dry Farming Institute. So we have hot and dry conditions in the Pacific. So hot and dry conditions was one of the um, causes of the severe wildfires uh, that we experienced in our state and our region this year. And one of the really striking things about the fires that happened in September was the horrible smoke. Um, I live, my, my family and I live out in a uh, rural town outside of uh, 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 Lebanon, uh, about 25 miles east of Corvallis. And this was a picture I took, uh, whoops, sorry about that. I feel like I'm got something going on here. Uh, here's a picture I took from my driveway in September during the wildfires. And this guy looked like Mars. Uh, ash was falling out of the sky on some of the, some of the days during the fires when they were really bad, and it covered everything. Uh, we had to stay indoors as much as possible, and uh, even had towels stuffed under our doors. Uh, the air perf we had air purifiers running all day, and this went on for like uh, about nine straight days. And I count our family lucky. Our home didn't burn down. Um, so compared to our neighbors in other towns to our north and south. I think we got off relatively easy. Uh, many people across this, our state in Oregon and also in California um, did not get off uh, so lucky. Um, and some of those regions in California and in the Southwest like Colorado are still experiencing some choking conditions and, uh, and bad smoke. So what, what, what is fire and smoke? Um, fire and smoke can also impact agriculture, of course. Uh, according to the Western Center for Agricultural Health and Safety, the direct effects of wildfires on agriculture include crop losses when fire actually gets into a, 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 a crop and, and burns it up, uh, which also can have soil impacts and also can impact uh, livestock. Uh, fires and wildfires produce these volatile uh, compounds called phenols. And these airborne compounds can travel in the air and settle onto things like wine grapes. And when these phenols are absorbed by the wine grapes, they get released during the fermentation process that gives the wine a real smoky taste and, and, and ruins it. 
um, and uh, generally red wines like uh, Pinot Noir grapes, which are, I think Oregon's, if not leading, one of the major types of wine uh, grapes that are grown in our state tend to be the most impacted. So the uh, wildfires can certainly impact agriculture directly when the fire catches a crop on fire, but they can also impact crops through smoke damage. Um, and most importantly, of course, uh, smoke uh, impacts people, um, uh, including farm workers. And I just wanted to mention real quick this uh, N NPR story that I thought was uh, pretty, was really good. Um, and an eye opener for me uh, was that back in early September about how farm workers uh, face dual threats this uh, fire season, both from COVID and poor air, and poor air quality. So um, as, as, the, as the article, uh, the story mentions, Dr. Carolyn Kennedy from a director of uh, Monterey County Health Department says uh, that farm workers face one hardship after another. Um, and they face stark choices about having to stay uh, indoors or having to go outside and work. Um, and when, when you're uh, behind on your bills, those are kind of uh, tough choices to make. And most people in the farm worker community uh, wind up uh, working in these kind of hazardous conditions. So I just wanted to mention that. I thought that was important uh, when we talk about impacts on agriculture. Okay, so uh, the second topic I wanted to, to, to go into was to discuss um, some of my experiences with a project I've worked on out in Gillum County, Oregon, um, which I think illustrates uh, how communities, what communities can do to sort of try to become more fire resilient. So by way of background, um, Gillum County is a small farming community out in North Central Oregon. There's only about 1500 people in the whole, whole county. It's one of Oregon's most sparsely populated uh, uh, counties in our state. And it's uh, it's fantastic. <laughs> As somebody like myself who who likes the outdoors and the wide open spaces, you you can't get uh, much better than uh, Gillum County, in my opinion. But the there is predominantly an agri agricultural community. They most of the what they grow out there is uh, is wheat. And over the years, they've had uh, just several really bad wildfires that have burned forests and agricultural lands in that area. And pictured here is a Landsat photo of uh, parts of um, the county that burned during a severe fire season in 2018. Now, as I showed you out of the map, this is a is a, is is an is a town east of the east of the Cascades. And for people not familiar with the Pacific Northwest, it's kind of the dry side of our state. Whereas here on the west uh, side, where we we are uh, here at uh, near Oregon State. Um, uh, that's more of kind of like doesn't burn as often. Um, so Gillum County out here in 2018, 2018 was their year to really um, uh, experience a, a bad fire season. I don't think it was too bad out there this year like it was here on the west side. So uh, with the help of uh, a grant that we got, or not that I, that I didn't get, but the, the, the Gilliam uh, Soil and Water Conservation District got through the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board, the county initiated an effort to increase fire resiliency. And one of the people that I know out there, one of my uh, uh, business contacts at the Gilliam County Soil and Water Conservation District asked if I could help come out and help them put some things together. So increase to increase community resiliency to wildfires, our first step was to organize a meeting to ask community leaders, first responders, volunteer firefighters and uh, landowners about what were their priorities and what types of things they needed to have in place to, do, to more effectively uh, fight uh, wildfires. And the biggest takeaway from that initial meeting was that everyone said they, that, that better maps were really important. Um, as anybody who works in firefighting knows, uh, speed is a major issue when it comes to initial fire response. And the community said that they really needed to update their maps and, and uh, take a better uh, accounting 
of uh, where where their assets were, where the roads were good, where the where the water was, and those kinds of things, and and have that in a in a format that could be easily accessible. So, so that's what we did. Um, um, we we put together uh, an open house. Um, where we had all of uh, the regional landowners from the community in this uh, this watershed that we are working in, and we asked them to come in and um, mark up a map, a map, a hard copy maps that we had printed, and show us on the maps where they had um, important resources, things like ponds, uh, water troughs, water tanks, cisterns. How many gallons were in those tanks um, and what types of spigot did they have that you could hook up a water tank, uh, a fire truck water uh, tank or two. Um, for, for, for example, sometimes they had tanks out there on the landscape, but that they weren't always compatible with hooking up to say a fire engine uh, pumper truck. So um, having all of that level of detail was really important as part of when we were building this map database. And we also, of course, wanted to know things about um, uh, road conditions, uh, how, how uh, names of landmarks, and, and saying something and asking them something about the, the fire priorities associated with, um, with, uh, with buildings, both residences, of course, and then outbuildings, and whether those outbuildings um, were uh, a value or were they abandoned, uh, kind of trying to get an idea of what those kind of priorities were um, across the, the different structures. And we asked them about their, their conditions of their roads. Could you get down that road with, uh, with, a, with a fire truck or just a regular truck or an ATV? And, and trying to capture all of that detail into one, one central location. And then after we had the landowners mark up that information on a map, uh, the final map product that we created was a series of data layers that we put into ArcGIS, which is the spatial mapping program. And then we exported those map layers into another program called Avenza PDF. And the Avenza program is what a lot of firefighters and community members use and have it on their cell phones. It's basically a, a PDF program with geo-referenced information on it. So when you open up the map on your phone, your phone's GPS would show your location relative to where you were trying to go. And uh, you would have all this, all these map layers right there at your fingertips, uh, like you see on the right. And just to be clear, Avenza isn't the only map type that, that can do these kinds of things. There are other ones, but uh, during the interview process, it became really clear that uh, for this community and other communities across uh, the, the region, that Avenza was the one that people used. So um, we, that's, that's what we tried to cater to uh, in our kind of final uh, product deliver, deliver, you know, something that they, that they could access and use um, to, uh, to get to the fires quickly. And the third thing that we did was that uh, we also took everything that we were put together locally and we gave uh, that to, um, we uploaded it to the Oregon State Fire Marshal's GIS office. And we, they had been actually out uh, visiting with us uh, at the start of this project. And we kept in, in contact with them because we felt that it was really important that uh, we didn't just create a localized uh, custom uh, map product uh, that, uh, that could only be, uh, you would, it would only be used kind of locally. We also wanted to uh, uh, coordinate with a, with a broader statewide agency. Because in the, in the events of like severe wildfires that happen, uh, of course, other agencies and other uh, groups come to help from outside the region. Uh, so we wanted to be, make sure that our custom maps were part of a, a statewide agency's database so that when, they, when other agencies had to come into a region, they could access those and have these kind of customized products uh, as part of the, the statewide database. Um, so that we thought that was really important. And our final map products, we got really great feedback from our local firefighters, uh, community members, and uh, they, they seemed to really, really like the work that we did. And, um, and um, my, um, my client, Herb Winters, who's the district conservationist at Soil and Water Conservation District said that 
even people were stopping them on the street saying how happy they were to have these maps. And, um, and so that was really great to hear. And in February of next year, I'll be going back out there to uh, expand our work to cover a bunch of other different watersheds um, that we didn't get to on the first go round. So if anyone would like more information about our pro that project, please just let me know. I think this map data kind of map data package could be really helpful to a lot of communities where there's a risk of wildfire, both here in Oregon and other places. So let's go ahead and move to uh, the, third, the third topic, using green fire breaks. So when it comes to, to fires, um, response time is, is really crucial. And that's particularly true for agricultural lands. Um, and as I mentioned, maps and communications are unquestionably important, but uh, getting to a fire quickly, whether it's understanding where you know, road conditions and, and where the fire is located and getting through the gates and understanding uh, other important things about infrastructure. One of the other real pluses for uh, minimizing fire impacts is slowing it down. Um, so um, one of those uh, strategies is uh, to use a, what's called a green fire break, also known as a, 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 a vegetative fire break. And the basic idea is to, <clears throat> excuse me, the basic idea behind a green fire break is to plant a strip of shrubs or plants along a line at the edge of a field, uh, like you see here in the picture on the left, and the basic concept is that as a fire is burning through, say, a wheat field really quickly, the green fire break will slow it down and buy the firefighters time to get out there to uh, put the fire out. Um, forage kochia is one type of shrub that has been shown to be a real excellent green fire break. Uh, it was first introduced in the United States from Eastern Europe in the 1960s, um, so it's non-native. But it, and it is a medium lived perennial semi evergreen half shrub that lives for about 10 to 15 years. And plants are about one to three feet tall and have a deep tap root. And that, um, uh, the deep tap root is one reason that it stays greener longer because they can access water further down in the soil profile. So, forage kochia. Uh, like I said, it tends to have a, a higher moisture content to say ag crops um, and as, as certainly ag crops at certain times of the year, late in the growing season, uh, and it won't burn as fast as other uh, vegetation. And, I, and again, it's not that it's, it won't burn, but it'll, it'll burn slower uh, than say like dry wheat stubble. And the, the USDA uh, NRCS office in, in Oregon has done a lot of uh, really great work, has done some work on uh, studied forage kochia. And you can find more info about their experiences and some of their um, uh, materials uh, online. Or you can, in, you can email me and uh, I can send you some of, the, um, of their info if anybody's interested. And like I said, while forage kochia isn't native, it, um, it's, and it's not the only shrub that could be a good green fire break. Uh, there are likely many native alternatives. I'm just highlighting forage kochia because Oregon NRCS has done some, some work um, with it and uh, has spoken very highly of its, effect, of, of its effectiveness. Matt, we have a question for you pertinent to okay, sure. out here. Uh, so Janelle is inquiring, do you have recommendations for a native substitute for forage kochia? Oh, thank you very much. Uh, that's perfect because uh, um, Marsha McIntyre of OSU Extension is going to give a, a description of a wide, wider array of plants um, that can use, be used as green fire breaks on November 10th. And uh, her, her, um, that event is called Fire and Plants, How to Reduce Your Risk of Wildfire. So at the end of my presentation, I have a, a, a resource uh, link and uh, for for that event. So the, sh the short answer is, I think they are. I don't know which ones they might be, but apparently um, uh, uh, Marsha McIntyre of OSU is going to be talking some of that about that next week in a, in a different type of in a different webinar. So let's see. 
Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think that uh, we'll we'll put your contact information um, in the box. I think people would love to have your contact info. I think you might have that at the end of your presentation, Matt. Is that yeah, I do. Yep, okay. my last slide. Yep, absolutely. There is one more question, maybe before you jump back in. Uh, for sure. The so do you have suggestions for forested areas for fire resiliency, particularly Western Oregon? She hears mm -hmm. lots about changing forest management practices, but no details on what those changes might be. Uh, mm -hmm. What can individual small timber, like 100 mm -hmm. acres or less owners do on their site, aside from standard thinning and fire breaks around structures? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. That's a great question. Uh, well, from a from a from a forest management point of view, the, the typical ones are, of course, thinning and and fire breaks, keeping uh, you know your your area clear, um, emptying your gutters, uh, all of those things that uh, that go with uh, you know preparing and, and preventing wildfires on on your property or in your in your forests. Um, the one that I was going to be talking about is is kind of more of your standard one, which is a uh, thinning removing ladder fuels and those kinds of things. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a tricky question. Like we saw here uh, this summer, uh, well-managed forest lands across Western Oregon, uh, high value timber lands, uh, we l just burned up because we, we, had, we had such kind of extreme weather conditions. Uh, in those kinds of, of cases, um, um, I don't think there's a whole lot you can do <laughs> when it when it gets to be a crazy uh, you know wildfire condition like that and things get going. I think the biggest thing is prevention. Uh, I think 70 or 80 percent of fires that start um, are, are are caused by people. Uh, so I think under having the community better informed and knowledgeable about how easily fires can be um, when the damage they can cause uh, so and so quickly. I think we we're all pretty shocked. Uh, here in Western Oregon about just just how quickly the fires just uh, went from from you know nearly catastrophic or catastrophic for lots of people. So I think yeah pre prevention is certainly is, is a big part of it thinning and keeping keeping defensible uh, spaces around your property and, and timber. Thank you, Matt. Okay. And uh, as far as uh, green fire breaks, uh, one of the last things I wanted to one of the last things I wanted to mention about that um, has to do with uh, beaver dams. There was a really interesting article in National Geographic just uh, back in September, and they had a title that beavers are North America's best wildfire best firefighter. And the author talks about how the reintroduction of beavers into the landscape can help hold and retain water and maintain green vegetation. And as the article mentions, by uh, building dams, forming ponds, digging canals, uh, that beavers irrigate vast stream corridors and can create fireproof zones in which plants and animals can shelter during wildfires. And in some cases, uh, the beaver dams and the repairing habitats that they, they, they form can stop fire right in its tracks. And I thought this image in the article was really uh, pretty striking, which is by Joe Wheaton of Utah State University. And in 2018, he was surveying a watershed in Idaho that had burned up in a wildfire when he came across this kind of oasis of green vegetation that hadn't burned. And it was, uh, it was beaver habitat. So he started looking into uh, how, um, uh, as, as land managers and researchers, we might be able to uh, um, encourage this, this kind of green vegetation habitat. And uh, Emily Fairfax at California State University has been uh, developing and working on uh, something called beaver dammed areas. And those are kind of like artificial beaver dams, essentially, uh, creating artificial beaver dams in landscapes and hopefully creating conditions ideal for uh, uh, for beavers. And to that point, um, I wanted to jump back to uh, some more work in uh, Gillum County because uh, uh, the Gillum County Soil and Water Conservation District 
is is doing just that. Um, they're involved in uh, putting in these BDA structures. Uh, in, in strategic locations across uh, certain watersheds. And historically, um, what these, what these uh, small streams have, have, have had big flood events, you know, periodic really intense rainfall events that kind of has scoured out the, uh, the, um, the streams and led to a lot of erosion. So what Gillum County is trying to do with these BDAs are trying to get the water to slow down and stay in place and build up. And they put in like 300 of these um, so far this year. And now uh, let me just clarify that to Amy's previous talk about w Oregon water law, I do want to emphasize that uh, Gillum County went through an extensive permitting process to do this um, before, before doing any of this work. Uh, on BDAs. I don't get the impression this is something that somebody can just put in willy-nilly wherever they want to, um, but, um, but through a proper permitting process, they can be kind of a low-cost way of um, uh, achieving what uh, the Gillum County Water Soil and Water Conservation District was looking to do, which was create better uh, fish habitat, uh, protect streams and riparian habitat, and create more water infiltration and those kinds of things. So here's a kind of a side view of what uh, the BDAs look like. Um, and uh, they seem relatively simple. And essentially you drive a series of stakes into the ground and then you weave uh, branches and debris through those stakes. Um, and this, what this does essentially is help retain water behind, uh, behind the structure, which helps with infiltration and when you have a little bit of water in a stream, especially during the hot summer months, temperatures heat up, of course. And uh, one of the one of the things that um, the folks in the soil and water conservation district like is that the idea is that we're going to get better. They're going to try to get better water infiltration, which which going through the ground cools the water off. So, and of course, this green vegetation is more resilient to wildfires. Um, again, I don't think. Um, and I know that, uh, you know, beavers uh, can, can create problems for farmers. They can damage farm in infrastructure, clog culverts and, and cause other issues. But when we talk about low cost strategies to retain more water on the landscape and making our uh, agricultural community more fire resilient, I think these kind of structures can be part of the solution as detailed uh, from, you know, Andrew's talk this morning. Um, if you want uh, more info about what uh, Gillum County is, is up to with these BDAs and their experiences, you can certainly just email me. Uh, I'll be happy to uh, tell you more about it or put you in touch with them. I think they have plans to put in over 3000 of these across um, the John Day watershed. And just that region of, the, of our state is the last remaining, um, it's like one of the largest remaining steelhead spawning um, water regions uh, in the whole uh, western U.S. or certainly in Oregon, and so and this is all helping uh, with that fish fish protection and restoration type of work that they're doing. But also, I think it can also benefit farmers. So how am I doing on time here? Still pretty good. Okay, so for um, my next uh, topic, I wanted just to mention a little bit about uh, some of the work that I've been doing on biochar amendments and how it can help increase soil moisture and help with water infiltration. So for those of you who don't know, uh, what is biochar? In short, it's a type of uh, purposefully made high temperature, kind of a natural charcoal. That's a simplified definition, but it's essentially that. And it's made for the purposes of being used as a soil amendment. And biochar has definitely gained a lot of attention the last several years. There's been hundreds of studies and thousands of research papers uh, that have been published both in the US and the United States, or in the US and overseas. And you can find a lot of great info about it on uh, the US Biochar Initiative. And I have a link at the end of my presentation to uh, get more information uh, from USBI if anyone's interested in. Now, biochar can be made from just about any waste biomass. Uh, here are a couple of electron microscope scans of biochar made from hazelnut shells, 
Douglas fir, uh, conifer wood, and the third one is uh, made out of uh, sugarcane pits. Biochar by itself is fairly nutrient poor. Uh, it doesn't have a, a real fertilizer value. Sometimes if you make it out of ag residues, uh, like, uh, you know, uh, that might have a little potassium in it. But generally, especially the stuff that we make out of, uh, of conifer wood or hazelnut shells, there's, 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 there's virtually no uh, fertilizer value. But as you can see in the images, it has a lot of nooks and crannies, which can help retain and hold on to water. Uh, kind of have like a sponge effect if you make it a certain way. And the small spaces are also good for supporting growth of soil microorganisms. It is particularly good on ag lands where soil pH is low because biochar is pretty basic. It has a pH of about eight. So it has a liming benefit in many cases when you apply it to soils. And in my biochar work, I focused most of my efforts on using uh, excess forest biomass like slash piles as a feedstock to make biochar. Um, Oregon um, has about, um, well, let me back up. Forest slash, for those of you who don't know the, the term forest slash, it's generated uh, following timber harvesting. And it is also created during forest thinning operations. Forest thinning um, is when you cut down small diameter uh, trees in order to um, um, thin them out so you can leave larger trees behind. Removing the smaller diameter trees uh, prevents uh, the f uh, when a fire, if a fire does break out from uh, the smaller trees uh, being uh, called what are called ladder fuels and causing ground uh, crown fires. So, so forest thinning or timber harvesting creates these slash piles, but these small diameter trees don't have any real commercial value and they are usually just piled up and burned on site. And in Oregon, there are about a million tons of forest slash piles that are burned each year. And that actually is about 1.6% of the state's annual greenhouse gas emissions. And of course, all the smoke uh, uh, also degrades air quality. So what, what, I, what I and others are trying to do is to create markets for this material so we can put it to better use and eliminate pile burning. And instead of burning it out in the woods, uh, why not try to make something useful out of it that farmers could use? That was basically been my focus um, for the last couple of years in my work with biochar. So how do you show biochar's value to farmers? Uh, one way is to try it out and try it out in, in, in grow trials and create data sets showing how biochar can increase yields and help with water retention. Um, my colleagues and I have done that with grants over the last couple of years, including with my business partner, John Miedema. And one grant that we had from the US Forest Service uh, gave us uh, the funding to try out two grow trials. And one of them was a, a dry farmed uh, trial that we did with, with Amy, Amy Garrett and a second one in blueberries. Uh, that, was, that work was done by Oregon State University and the USDA Department of Agriculture. Uh, Dr. Dave Bryla and Brian Sales. So we basically wanted to set up these, these grow trials to show uh, if there to determine if there's any benefit from using this uh, biochar material. So in, 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 in the uh, dry farm trial, Amy added about one and a half yards of biochar to the soil surface in a 10 foot by 100 foot row and then worked it into the soil. Um, and I think that application rate worked out to be about eight tons per acre. Now, the, the, the trial that we did there was not a fully replicated block study. And the biochar was only added to a single row in this case, because basically uh, this was a, an experiment that Amy was, was doing. And uh, she, she allowed us to uh, uh, um, uh, basically join, join the study that she was doing already, which was really great. Um, but so even though it wasn't like this, this wasn't a full, full blown kind of uh, biochar replicated trial, uh, there were some interesting findings that I, that Amy found that warrant further research. And here are a couple of them that I thought were interesting. Real quick, Matt, we have a question yeah. pertinent to the rate. Uh, Harriet, yep. Hey Harriet, 
uh, is inquiring um, if you could repeat the amount of biochar to that uh, 10 by 100 foot row. Um, and, you know, I don't know, I don't remember if that was a prescribed amount per information that you and John had, or mm -hmm. yeah, so if you could reiterate the rate and if there was any um, thought that went into that rate. That's a great question. Uh, it was 1.5 yards of biochar onto a 10 foot by 100 foot row. And I, if memory serves, I think what drove that, and that, that if I've got my math right, and correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> but I worked that out to be, uh, I think it was, I think it was eight tons per acre was what we, we came up with for a per acre rate. And is that a standard rate that's applied? No, I think, uh, you know, uh, John, uh, my business partner, John, who who, who was, is trying to make, make it uh, not, uh, I think a lot of researchers say, oh, we need more like 10 or 20 or 20 more, more yards per acre, which just really isn't practical for, for, for uh, developing commercial markets for, for biochar. And I think uh, I think John recommended that rate, um, which is probably something like I want to say maybe five ten percent. So yeah, uh, I'd have to go back and look look at it, but I, I think it was it was kind of a mixture of we have to put enough on to to, to think we will show a benefit, but not too much. That, that, that wouldn't make it uneconomical. It was kind of a sweet spot in between, I think was part of the reason. Okay, so economics was part of it. Um, Absolutely. We've got another question for you, Matt, here from Don. Uh, sure. He's asking, what, what's the weight per yard of biochar? Oh boy, that's a great question. <laughs> uh, it, it really kind of depends. And I, I really, I hate answering questions like that. I don't, I, I don't like the word it depends because um, that's not really an answer, but it really does depend. <laughs> if if you're making it out of like uh, like three inch wood chips, um, that's going to be different than if you're making it out of like sawdust, uh, just because the way it packs. Um, basically, when you make biochar, the way the, the the condition of the feedstock that you put into it, it doesn't change much uh, when you when it comes out, other than being you know cooked um, and and charcoal basically. You lose probably two thirds of the um, of the, uh, the the weight when you do that, um, but uh, but the size stays, stays relatively the same. So the simple answer is, if you look at um, say a yard of biochar, we've looked at really powdery biochar all the way to like the really chunky stuff that you might make out of firewood. So it it does really depend, but a good rule of thumb would probably be. Uh, for your most of your conifer wood char, probably about 300 pounds per yard. But again, it would it would vary. I've seen it, you know, as high as 800 pounds per yard, and as low as you know maybe 150 pounds per yard. Okay. Does that help? That maybe one more. Yeah, uh, we have one more question here, maybe before you go into the results of the biochar trials. Sure. Um, yep. Harriet's inquiring about depth of planting or mixing the biochar in the rows. I know that when mm -hmm. we incorporated that, we uh, we had a tiller as the equipment we had available on that site. So it was surface applied and then we um, the tiller went to a depth of eight inches. But is that standard in what you've mm -hmm. seen in the other trials? Yeah, exactly. Um, in most cases, yeah, you're trying to put it at the at, in the root zone in the in the areas where the plants can access it and things like that. And um, but that's a great question. Um, I, I that's really that's been one of the challenges with biochar in the past is is how do you how do you incorporate it into the soil or into existing um, fertilizer or or other kinds of um, 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 farm equipment because you know if you, you just have raw biochar it gets kind of dusty and it, you, you spread it out in the field and and it could could you know you got to be able to pack it and I've learned all of that stuff from uh, John and um, and how to try to figure out how to package the biochar to apply it uh, but it's a great question but yeah um, but essentially standard from a standard 
application point of view in agriculture, it would be in that in uh, in that eight inch first eight inches of soil type of range. Where for a tiller or for uh, we're working on some stuff with maybe trying to make some pellets so that we can broadcast it uh, through kind of fertilizer application um, um, equipment and those kinds of things. So let's see uh, if we want to hop into uh, some of the results that Amy found as part of the, the trial uh, from a couple of years ago. Um, she found that the yellowfin potatoes had uh, higher yields with biochar compared to areas without biochar. And for winter squash, the variety uh, Stella Blue in the biochar treatment produced a yield twice that of the dry farmed uh, treatment without biochar. And I do want to emphasize that these results were highly variable by, by variety type. In other words, biochar can work on some plants and in some soils, but in others, it can show no effect or negative effects. Um, so I just wanted just to make, make sure that I'm not trying to promote or say that biochar is going to make your uh, all crops and all soils and all circumstances improve, but it, it, can, it does work. Um, in certain cases, in certain varieties, in certain soils. So for the, um, the next, the next uh, GROW trial that we did as part of our grant uh, involved uh, the blueberry, uh, working with the blueberries. And so we, we, we actually applied, we, well, the researchers came up, well, we worked with the researchers to come up with a couple of different tests, but they basically applied the biochar in two ways because we basically wanted to test it out on a new, if, if somebody was planting a new field with, with, with uh, blueberries, how you, how you might apply it effectively and economically. So in, in one replicate we did, uh, we applied the biochar into the, into, put it right into the planting hole at about 20% 20, 20 of the volume of the planting hole we put in the, put in the biochar and then put in the blueberry plant. And that worked out to be about one ton of biochar per acre on average. And in the other replicates that we that they did, we decided to apply it as a uh, top dressing uh, mixed with sawdust, because that is kind of a standard way of um, um, applying um, amendments to uh, blueberries. They get these um, uh, applications of, of sawdust um, at the soil surface. So we thought, well, that might fit well with um, uh, existing uh, uh, established plants of blueberries already planted that uh, could be a potential market for biochar that way. So we wanted to test it both, uh, both ways. The variety was uh, Duke high, high Bush Blueberry uh, was the variety. And after two years of uh, growing the plants, um, um, the, the folks at OSU and USDA ARS harvested the fruit and they found that uh, biochar increased uh, fruit yields by 50, over 50%. It was really something else. And they also found that the soil microbial counts in the roots increased by over 70% compared to the plants without the biochar. And it's one of the reasons we think it works so well because we think not me, but the, the professors and the researchers were, were, were explaining that perhaps that the porous nature of the biochar was creating a uh, more, more of a habitat for uh, soil microbes. And so with more soil microbes, they were perhaps getting better nutrient exchange between the soil and the plants, hence um, the boost in, um, in plant yields. So and, and the OSU folks were, were really quite surprised by the results because going into this trial, they explained to us that blueberries are an acid loving plant. Uh, they, blueberries kind of evolved in like bogs and things like that, which are pretty acidic. So the notion of putting in a basic material like biochar into blueberries um, uh, was, they were game for it obviously, but um, but they were like, this is not gonna work probably. But they were really, you know, we were all pleasantly surprised that it did. So the bottom line is um, uh, the biochar did boost the yields in the blueberries by quite a bit. And we wanna continue this work and try it out on other berry crops like strawberries and in other different soil types. And just like with uh, Amy's trial with, uh, the, with the dry farm vegetables, we'd like to try it out um, 
uh, with more replicates and, and other in different soil types. And we're trying to get uh, the word out to farmers and others that uh, biochar is uh, maybe something they might wanna try out themselves because it can work in certain cases. And then uh, just really quick, um, I'll try to go quick through here. I just wanted to mention some other work that we're doing with biochar, both on using it as not just a soil amendment, but as a filter, a filtration system. We got a project going down in Klamath Falls, working with a farmer who uh, is trying to remove phosphorus, dissolve phosphorus from the irrigation water. So my business partner, uh, John Miedema and I are working with Miles Gray at Geosyntech on a system to uh, use the biochar that's made out of conifer biomass from thin forest material. So we got problematic uh, biomass that's, 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 you know, causing wildfire hazards. And we're trying to make it into something that we can use to solve an on-farm problem. And these kind of forest to farm projects and collaboratives are, are, are I think, uh, really great because we're trying to solve multiple problems at once. The second, the second work that a project I just wanted to mention real quick was, um, the Nebraska feed trial that we're doing with biochar. I'm not involved with the feed trial, but I was asked by the folks at the University of Nebraska and the Nebraska Forest Service uh, to help them try to quantify the amount of forest bio, excess forest biomass that they have in their forest, mostly around eastern, uh, eastern red cedar, which is like a problematic variant of uh, what we got here in Eastern Oregon and Washington, which is um, uh, Western juniper. So I'm doing some work trying to assess that resource to find out how much excess biomass material they have. And the folks at UNL and Nebraska Forest Service are running a, a feed trial to see if feeding biochar to cattle at about 1% of the food ration uh, in other places in Europe and in uh, Canada, they've shown that feeding biochar to cattle can help their digestion, which can help with um, uh, ultimately weight gain, healthier animals um, is, is kind of what we're what they're testing out there again it's trying to say can we take a problematic uh, forest resource and make it into biochar and feed it to cattle and and and, and maybe lower the input costs uh, and the feed costs for the farmer and, and get better weight gain and um and healthier animals so matt we have a question for you sure absolutely uh, Okay, Jeanette's asking, uh, is it possible or feasible for people to make biochar at home for their gardens? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, Kelpie Wilson uh, has done a lot of work on that of making um, a biochar um, at, at, the, at, the, uh, at, the, at the smaller scale, like with um, the garden scale. And, um, and if you Google, and she lives, uh, she's uh, based out of Southern Oregon. Um, and I think she's got a whole series of, um, of workshops and she might even have one coming up. I would encourage you to, uh, um, I can send you her email or contact information, but if you Google Kelpie Wilson, um, I think she has a, a series called Green Your Head, where she has a series of workshops of making biochar um, at sort of a backyard or garden level scale. Is that good? Uh, yeah, so there's yeah. Um, another um, just kind of question slash comment. Um, yeah. does, uh, does biochar with the cattle um, as, as, as a feed, uh, does it mm -hmm. help with meth methane um, reduction? Yeah that's, yeah, that's a great point. I, um, that was the, the original reason that, um, that the University of Nebraska started this trial was as a greenhouse gas mitigation strategy. And what they did was their first the first trial they did was with only, I think, five animals. And um, they had them uh, in kind of a, a barn that was kind of like a, a cube of some kind where they could measure greenhouse gas emissions and methane emissions. And, and they, fed it, they fed the cows, the five cows, biochar. And um, they found, I think their paper showed something like a 25% reduction in methane emissions. So um, I don't know what the results of this larger trial are. That's, that's part of the reason they, 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 they wanted to try it out on a bigger scale. And the, this um, project that I, I'm mentioning here has, is now a 100, um, 100 cattle um, trial, which was FDA approved. Um, and that's what they're right in the middle of. But the short answer is yes, they, um, they, 
there in some in some cases that in some trials I've seen in the literature and, and in Nebraska's case, uh, a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by about 25 percent. Great, thank you, Matt. Yeah. And, um, yeah. There's excitement about the reduction in methane production, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, Ben shared a link for Wilson biochar. So. Uh, yeah, keep using the chat box. In at the end of Matt's presentation, um, mm -hmm. we can have uh, maybe come out of our uh, turn our videos on and have a discussion. <laughs> so I'll hand it back off to you, Matt. Okay. Okay. Great. Great. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, absolutely. No, that, that was one of the reasons that I, I think that's really so important. I think uh, um, uh, the carbon benefits or the greenhouse gas benefits as we deal with uh, climate change. I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a big fan of, or a big believer in the idea that that uh, growers, that um, that growers, farmers uh, can be have to be part of the the solution to that. And so, I wanted to just wrap up my talk here with uh, talking really briefly about carbon offsets and um, how soil amendments, biochar, carbon, dry farming, and other techniques techniques can actually get credit under certain circumstances through the voluntary carbon uh, marketplace. And there is a, uh, a, a protocol that you that you have basically have to follow. It's called through, in this case, uh, a group called Vera. And they're developing, um, or Indigo, who is the company that's developing it, is developing a methodology for improved agricultural land management. And I think it just got approved. So uh, kind of hot off the presses. Um, but what we have shown is and discussed is that dry farming and other kind of forms of agricultural techniques like adding soil amendments can create water benefits, benefits, enhancements in soil health and increases in crop yields. And in addition to all those benefits, uh, there's, there's options like with the use of this uh, um, carbon protocol where you can potentially get uh, carbon credits uh, for adopting some of these practices. Uh, it could also involve, and under this particular protocol, planting a cover crop or uh, going to uh, other kind of techniques uh, that could be eligible for uh, crediting. Um, so it's it it's it's highly variable. Um, and just as kind of early stage, but this is unquestionably an opportunity. And that was, one, that was the, one of the reasons I wanted to put it in my presentation because I'm getting, you know, as I'm talking to folks in the agriculture community and the forestry community and the finance community, I keep hearing over and over again about, you know, more and more about uh, the desire to make uh, agriculture uh, part of a, a soil carbon building um, carbon marketplace. The voluntary carbon markets go for about carbon dioxide, a ton of carbon dioxide. It's sold by the ton, ton of CO2. It goes for about eight to ten dollars uh, per ton on average, and um, depending on the soil practice, I, I couldn't tell you right down to the dollar what you, what it might be worth, but somewhere I would guess somewhere in the fifteen to thirty dollars per acre in extra income could come from um, carbon carbon markets like uh, the voluntary carbon standard. So maybe not a huge sum. But it illustrates that there are potentially monetary co-benefits of dry farming and other techniques um, uh, that um, can build soil health and fertility, retain moisture while also storing uh, carbon. And so with that, I'll uh, wrap up my presentation and um, I hope um, everybody um, enjoyed it. And if, uh, you, if you want more information, here are some of the resources uh, that I've listed. Um, during that I came that I came across to, that I talked about during my um, talk, and I'm happy to follow up uh, with you by email or um, or by phone if you want to uh, any more information of things that I didn't list on my resource page. So uh, with that, I'll be happy to answer any more of your questions. Would you go, um, Matt? Can you go back to your contact information in case folks want to write that down? Oh yeah, sure. Sorry. Um, so we have a question from Erin Upton. Uh, she said, very uh, interesting uh, stuff, Matt. Do you know if biochar production is better uh, for sequestering forest carbon than burning those slash fuels? That's a great question. Um, I've looked at that and um, I, think, I think it can be. Um, 
like for example, it's it's really go it it is kind of goes into a, when it, when you get anything carbon related, it certainly is a question of 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 kind of the carbon accounting. Like for example, if you go into a uh, old old growth intact forest and and chop trees down and create um, uh, slash piles and burn them um, and make them into biochar or sorry make them into biochar. I can't say that you're 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 creating a carbon benefit by by um, by um, um, harvesting a, sort of an old growth forest that that'll never uh, work, in my opinion. But if if you're if you're burning it in a slash pile um, versus your basically when you're burning in a slash pile, you burn about eighty five to ninety five percent of the material. And in biochar, if you make it in pyrolysis, you're only going to be actually burning about 70% of that material. So the um, you, you're, you're going to be keeping more of that carbon in a product that you're going to be putting into the soil as opposed to released into the atmosphere. Another question for you, Matt, from Jeanette. Are there any experiments involving uh, biochar uh, to recently logged or thinned forest areas? Uh, would that be an appropriate use for slash piles involving adding biochar? Yeah, that, that's that's another excellent question. Uh, Debbie Dumrose from the Rocky Mountain Research Station out of Idaho has done a lot of really good work on that very question about how to make biochar in the woods and use it in a um, uh, uh, tree nurseries uh, in, in uh, or using it out in the woods. Um, and uh, um, and yeah, absolutely. They can, for example, yes, there has been, there have been some experiments with, uh, does it boost, uh, seedling survival? Um, does it, does it, uh, does it boost, uh, getting things to go to get to free to uh, free to grow stage a couple feet high quickly? Um, um, and those kinds of things with biochar that has shown benefit in some, in some, in some, in some cases, no question about it. And we're 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 definitely interested. John and I are looking at some other things with the Forest Service to try to talk about road reclamation. So after the timber harvest is over, could you use biochar to help get uh, vegetation and other things uh, reestablished on roads? Because that's a huge issue too for 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 um, dirt roads and logging roads after things are um, reclamation work with it too. Okay, great. Um, well. We can continue using the chat box, but Matt, would you go to the next uh, slide real quick? Absolutely. So I want to highlight um, that uh, your evaluation of, uh, of today would be very important to us. So uh, if uh, after we get done here today uh, or in the next couple of days, if you could fill this out, we would really appreciate it. The link is also in the chat box and um, we'll be sending it out in a follow-up email along with links links to our video recordings so that you have access to those to share with others or view again if you'd like. Um, and maybe one more time to the very last slide, Matt. So um, the website there, dryfarming.org, is where these videos will be archived. And as I mentioned, this, uh, this event was um, uh, Oregon State University a Small Farms Program and the Dry Farming Institute kind of partnered to organize this event and all the other um, partners, including USDA, NEFA, Western Extension Risk Management were our funders and everybody else helped to get the word out. Um, but we would really like to um, build, uh, you know, this to be a, an, an event that happens like perhaps every two years. And um, so in the evaluation, there's questions that invite your input for uh, additional topics, additional speakers, um, and so I encourage you to fill that out if you've got to cut out early. But in the meantime, um, maybe Matt, you could stop your screen share. Okay. Absolutely. And we could, um, we've been uh, watching presentations all day, uh, but if you would like to, uh, I, I'm curious about reflections on the day for those of you that have attended all three sessions or maybe just Matt's presentation um, or the last two. Uh, be curious if in the chat box, if you're shy, um, could enter in any reflections or ideas, uh, but also feel free um, to unmute yourself. I think we can unmute all with the click of a button. Tegan, would you mind helping me with that? 
So uh, if you are, feel inspired to share anything on reflections about the day or ideas for a future event like this, um, this would be a good time to do it. We have, uh, we allocated until 2.30 uh, for this. So please uh, feel free to um, give us your input. Okay, well, I'll go. Hi, Kim. Thank you. Hi. Um, I found it, I'm, I'm in Washington, so water law for you Hi. is not the same as water law for me. Um, Water mini, stop, sorry. And um, anyway, but I was really encouraged to hear her saying, okay, we're going to work water law to work with um, the techniques that are ha were happening in the first presentation. That was so encouraging to me. Um, really, really glad to hear it. Um, and then also the additional resources that you guys put forward, because a lot of this doesn't apply to me. I have a very small plot. I'm not looking at 100 acres. I'm looking at two and a half with neighbors and, and uh, you know, the kinds of blocked out land and slopes and things that come with having close neighbors like that. But I do have a little better understanding how to how to manage this. And then to be able to, you know, look at the other pre presenters that are coming up. Excellent resources. You, you gave me everything I needed today. Thank you, Kim. We got a couple comments here in the chat box. Um, maybe the shy, the shy people. I completely understand. I'm shy too. Um, so Stephanie mentions uh, thinking about reclaiming the roads after timber. Um, have you thought about adding mycelium to help contain the chemicals? So Matt, maybe that's a good question for you. Yeah, actually, my business colleague John uh, would know more about that particular uh, question for sure, uh, which where he's taken biochar and kind of uh, combined it with um, like a bokashi to try to form mycelium. Is that right? Uh, is that, am I getting that mycelium fungi, uh, the right uh, mm -hmm. term? And, and yes, I, I, think, uh, I think any of that would certainly help with um, plan establishment and certainly uh, helping with um, pollution uh, runoff probably as well. I know, for example, in our uh, project in Klamath Falls, that's one of the things that, and John John Miedema has done a great deal of work on that, uh, biochar's ability to capture heavy metals, copper, zinc from running off from roofs and agricultural buildings and those kinds of things. It does great at uh, capturing things from uh, stormwater and wastewater. Absolutely. Great. We got some uh, good comments on feedback about um, today's format. Catherine um, uh, thought it was really helpful that we had uh, the pre each presenter kind of referenced the other presentations so, um, so that they were complementary and nice to see the intersections of the various issues um, and have different actors in the system talking about it from their perspectives. Thank mm -hmm. you, Catherine. This is all helpful. Yeah, thank you. Another question for you, um, Matt, from from Rich, and then Harriet, I, I saw that you popped up there. Maybe we'll have Matt answer Rich's question and then um, would love your voice. Um, yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. I see that, Rich. Uh, yeah. yeah. Did you, see you know, that was really, that's really a great question, Rich. Uh, I think we all expected that the pH was going to change after putting so much biochar in some of the blueberry trials. And they, they, they really didn't, um, as, um, at least um, I think they, they, they told us that it had a high, that the soil might have had a high buffering capacity so that maybe the addition of the biochar didn't really affect the overall pH of the soil. And I, I, I think that's a good thing. Um, I'm not an agronomist, but um, we didn't see a drastic change in soil pH, in the, at least in the blueberry example. Thanks, Matt. Harriet, did you want to um, share before we answer more chat box questions? Oh, well, I was busy filling out the um, 
questionnaire when you were asking what we would like to share, but without knowing, I just want to say, I thought it was really informative. I learned a lot of things about things I didn't know. Um, I like the broad spectrum. I, I, you know, thought every, the presenters were really clear and informative. Um, and I just really enjoy being a part of a growing uh, dry farming community and really appreciate these symposiums, this symposium and look forward to other ones. So that's what I want to say. And I did ask the question what the name of the woman was from the green your head, what her name was again, I think a Katie something I don't remember. Oh, I'm name. sorry. Yeah, her yeah. name is Kel I'll type it in the chat chat box there. Oh, her name is uh, Kelpie Wilson. Kelty Wilson. Okay. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Harriet. That's a uh, yeah, pleasure. It's always my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a comment from a shy one, uh, Alina. Um, so she wanted to thank everybody for putting this together and uh, for the info today. She's fairly new to these topics and uh, thought it was helpful to learn about all the resources that we can access and was worth the time. So that thank you, uh, Alina. So she's looking forward to the next symposium. So um, yeah, I would love to gather more partners. And uh, since all of you registered for this event, um, I, it will probably uh, we'll, you'll have we'll have your evaluation data, but we'll also maybe um, start emailing um, the group to pull who's interested in uh, providing input on speakers, topics, partners uh, at some point. Um, so Jeanette has another comment. Maybe that's uh, directed towards you, Matt. Uh, so metals, uh, zinc, etc., captured by biochar. Does it need to be removed from the site or can it just be sequestered in the soils? Mm. That's a great question. Um, yeah, my, my business partner, John, would, would be able to answer that better. But my, in my work with him, looking over his shoulder when he's been building these um, metal capture and zinc capture uh, filter systems, uh, he typically d doesn't put them on soils, I don't believe. I think he, he disposes of them after they're kind of the cartridges essentially spent. Uh, but one of the things that he's talked about doing, uh, like, is trying out some of the the potential uses. And for example, in the Klamath Falls project that we're working on, where we're trying to capture phosphorus, one of the things the farmer came out and said right out right out of the gate, and others that it was like, well, once we're done filtering the phosphorus, does could we use the biochar that's loaded up with phosphorus for for soil amendment? And and we said, sure, it probably would. You know. Um, we're not sure it's gonna, the whole, the whole thing is of course, is it plant available? Um, and well, actually, so OSU extension down in Southern Oregon is gonna be starting a, a grow trial with um, the spent biochar material that we're, we're gonna be using for our project. And um, we're, gonna, we're gonna find out. <laughs> so kind of stay tuned, I guess, is the, is the best answer for that. <laughs> I can jump in and, and express some appreciations. Um, I really appreciated today the, the intersection of the various topics and the, the clarity and the efficiency. So much information came and, um, and how it fit together was very um, um, well, very fit together very well. And one of the things that I would um, I'm really looking forward to being part of the ongoing conversation and, and take part in this on an ongoing basis. And then one of the ideas that jumps to mind already as um, another angle to bring in is how for people like me, who's an individual on our own farm to be joining into cooperative projects. So if there's someone who could talk about how individuals can be uh, joining in cooperative projects with others. I'm not part of an organization or I'm not employed by someone. So I don't have something already going like that, but I would, I can see that there's not a whole lot I'm gonna be able to do by myself, much bigger than a really small thing. So I, but I'd love to be part of a bigger thing in cooperation. 
Are there any particular examples of um, projects that um, you would like to be involved in? I like to help, um, you know, make those connections in my work. So if you have any examples, it'd be helpful to, um, to clarify. Like, for example, the, um, the, the various things to improve the water uh, resource on our place. We have an enormous water resource on our place and it's really inspiring to hear how um, the farmers in Southern Oregon by doing what they're doing on their farms are improving the water resource for their neighbors. Those kinds of things. Great, thank you. Or also um, um, cropping. Cropping in, in cooperation with others and to benefit others. That's great feedback. Thank you. I would love to um, collaborate and support that. Really exciting. Thanks so much for putting this together. Thank you for joining us and Thank participating. You. Thank you. We got hello? a comment. Oh yeah, please. Oh, hello. Uh, my name is Don. I just wanted to also express my appreciation for all of you who put this event together and put together the seminars and all the work in the planning. Um, I am not new to subjects of rainwater harvesting. I actually took a, a course for learning how to design rainwater harvesting systems, uh, but I am new to Oregon. I only moved here about a year ago, so it's been a big question on my mind how to navigate uh, Oregon water law. So I found that that seminar was uh, really beneficial for me. Um, and uh, following that up with, with uh, defensible space for farms and, and farm scale water management, um, I, of course, really appreciate the the details around soil carbon and biochar because that's been an interest of mine, in particular combining it with rainwater harvesting, uh, which leads me to a question I have for Matt. He mentioned this, um, this company called Vera. If I understood this correctly, they're a company who can help you track soil carbon. Yeah, that uh, Don, actually it was uh, the company that was writing the protocol um, that I refer to was, well, the, basically the, the organization that houses the protocol, almost like a certification organization was called Vera. Okay. But the actual standard that's listed under that was by being developed by a company called, there's that slide. Indigo. Indigo. Okay, cool. Yeah. So are they like a soil testing lab who should accept a soil sample by mail for soil testing mm -hmm. of carbon mm -hmm. content? What they typically, yeah, I, I don't know much about the company itself, um, um, but, but um, I think they're a company that's uh, looking to um, you know, do something about climate change and developing um, um, incentives for for farmers and those kinds of things. Well, how, the, how those typical uh, protocols work is you just take your soil sample to a certified lab, for example, and, and something like, uh, you know, an OSU uh, life sciences ag ag agriculture would, would certainly fit the bill to do the actual testing. But I can find out more information for you about indigo. Well, you're looking for that, Matt. I just yeah. wanted to uh, give voice to the to the chats um, because the recording will capture um, what we say, but the chat box is not recorded. So um, there was excitement about uh, Lisa's idea um, that she vocalized about the uh, cooperative projects. And um, there was uh, someone mentioned, Stephanie mentioned uh, our veteran organization in Oregon, Washington and Family Farm in Placerville, California. 
And then Kathy mentioned to try uh, your local conservation district. So those are great, great input. Um, and great. So there's a, Janelle just shared a link too for, um, uh, that's pertinent, I think, to what you're looking at, Matt. Okay. Indigo Partners with Vera and Climate Action Reserve to measure soil carbon. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. sounds, that sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else have uh, comments, reflections, ideas for how we can um, connect more on, on this uh, in the future, adaptive ag water management? Oh, Janelle just mentioned Nori. Yeah, I'm on their email list too, which is uh, also working with AG to sequester carbon. So nori.com, um, and she just put that in the chat box. Um, oh. I, I think they, they host podcasts and yeah, I've seen some information oh. from them as well on this as well. Oh, great. I never heard of them, that's great. Well, I think you. a great um, follow-up for me that would be helpful, um, this is Catherine, uh, would just be, I really appreciated uh, all the different case studies um, and either having more regional case studies or even ones that are, um, I don't know if your audience is going to be broader. I know, Amy, at the beginning, you mentioned that there were people um, from uh, different areas, not just from the Pacific Northwest in attendance. Um, and I did find it really helpful, Andrew's presentation on India, even though it's a different um, a different climate than we have here, there's definitely applications here. Um, but just more examples of that, whether there's some specifically in the Pacific Northwest or others in other parts of the world that maybe have similar climates, um, I find that really helpful just to see some actual physical examples and um, think really helps get me thinking about what we can do here, so. Thank you, Catherine. Yeah, case studies really kind of bring it out, bring it down to the ground. And, you know, I think it's a lot easier for me and yeah, others to stand, understand as well when it's highlighted in a real life example. Yeah, we'll strive to do that more. Yeah, that's a great point. Well, we have just a couple more minutes. Um, is anybody sitting on something that um, they're itching to share before we bring this uh, to a close and adjourn? Oh, well, uh, you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, well, I just from the um, food uh, foodie perspective or whatever, I don't know what you call it, but uh, it would be good if we had some um, discussion about the, um, the challenge perhaps of competing with traditionally grown, not just organic, but traditionally, well, traditional organic foods and because, you know, something about yield and cost and then taste and how it compares and what's uh, being done to sort of create an identity or marketing and maybe, you know, someone who comes in and talks about flavors and, you know, just something from that end of the, the, the end of the dry farming experiment. So having some uh, culinary voices that can speak to produce quality uh, from dry farming. And, and the challenges I think in terms of competing, being um, competitive because, um, you know, spacious, spacing is wider and yield may be, you know, higher, lower, but um, that, that I've heard that as being maybe one of the challenges. So, you know, you know, if it's appropriate in this meeting, sort of that the end of that, you know, what distinguishes it besides the economic, I mean, the environmental benefits, but um, then how do we get that onto the people's plate? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great idea. 
if we had, I think that would be, uh, if we had a full day event, that would have been maybe like um, part one of the tracks even perhaps. So that's, that's great. That's great feedback. Thank you. It looks like Erin Upton um, has some case studies she's happy to share in the wine industry in Oregon regarding water management and biochar. So oh, I'm, I'm writing down your email address, Erin. Oh, that's terrific. No, I would like to hear more. Be a, a presenter at the next Adaptive Ag. Um, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Terrific. All right. Well, um, that brings us to 2.30. So uh, it's time to adjourn. But um, thank you, everybody, for joining us today and sticking around and giving your uh, feedback and input. We really appreciate it. And uh, we'll be following up with an email. Um, if you haven't already filled out the evaluation, we'll share it again um, with the evaluation link and recordings from today's presentations for later viewing or to share with others. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank Bye. You. Take care, Harriet. Hey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.